um, will agree that they've really set the set the tone for the, for the session um, and the rest of the event. Um, and yeah, um, I just wanted to say thanks to to all the students for such great insights. Um, but we are moving on to introduce our keynote speaker, who will be Professor Charles Egbu, um, who joined the university in November 2020 as Vice Chancellor. With more than 25 years experience in higher education, um, Professor Egbu was previously Pro Vice Chancellor for Education and Experience at the University of East London, where he was responsible for student experience, student success, student retention, quality assurance and enhancement, um, the Centre for Excellence in the Learning and Teaching and the Students' Union. He is also a member of various external bodies, including the Advanced HE Pro Vice Chancellor Network and QAA Panel of Experts. Prior to this, Professor Egbu was Dean of the School of Built Environment and Architecture at London South Bank University and Head of the School of Built Environment at the University of Salford um, and held academic posts at University College London, Glasgow Caledonian University and Leeds Beckett University, former Leeds Metropolitan. His first degree was in quantity surveying. His doctorate was obtained in the area of construction pro uh, project management. Today, he will be discussing his higher education journey from being an international Nigerian student to the first black male vice chancellor in the UK, um, alongside Nadra Mercer, co-chair of the Race, Race Equality Charter self-assessment team at Leeds Trinity. There will be a live Q&A at the end of this session, so you can use the chat box on the right hand side to ask questions and everyone's been using that really well, so thank you. Um, use the thumbs up response um, if other audience members uh, have asked questions you're interested in, which I know a lot of you've been doing. Um, so we have an idea as, as to how many people are interested in this area of conversation. Um, you can also join in the conversation on Twitter using hashtag LTBLM and at Leeds Trinity. So without further ado, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Charles Egbu and um, Dr. Nadra Mercer. Uh, thank you very much for that, Madeline. Charles, welcome back again. Uh, as you can see, you've got a very hard act to follow after listening to <laughs> our students and their experiences. And I think in a way they've actually laid down a gauntlet. They've sort of told us a lot about the things that they want changing. So I think my conversation with you is really about your experiences from the boy growing up in Nigeria to the international student in the UK to being one of the first, well, the first black male vice chancellor in the UK. And we're extremely proud and pleased that you chose Leeds Trinity University to cut your teeth as that first vice chancellor. Um, so a little bit about your experiences and then your views um, views about what you've heard today from our students as well, and then something around your ambitions for us as an institution and for the, the country you want us to become and our place uh, in the world as well. So to start with, um, Charles, what was it like growing up in Nigeria and then having that ambition or was it an ambition to come to study in the UK? Nadira, can I just say thank you very, very much? And I will answer that question, but uh, before I do, can I just say a huge thank you to all the members of the organizing committee of uh, this uh, very, very timely and useful uh, uh, conference. Can I just pay a huge um, thank you and depth of gratitude to our students and al alumni for their bravery, uh, the power in their articulation of their life experiences, their candor and their honesty. I think that's very, very useful. Uh, coming to the question you've asked me, uh, growing up in Nigeria, um, I, I, I was very, very fortunate uh, growing up uh, in Nigeria um, with uh, a father uh, who was a civil servant and a mother who uh, was a nurse. And uh, I have, three other siblings and for my parents education was number one number two number three to number ten nothing else matters so i grew up knowing nothing else and in the and in my own days uh your parents determined what you want uh to be and what uh, you have to be so I have my parents saying 
you need to be this, you need to be that to my, my, my siblings. But education was uppermost. But sadly, uh, when I was a, a teenager in, in my late teens, my dad passed away and I thought my world collapsed under me. But I had a very, very strong, uh, very, very articulate mother, uh, albeit a nurse, who just two years before my dad died, was sent her overseas to continue her nursing degree. So when my dad died, hugely disappointing, hugely stressful, highly traumatic. But uh, I had the opportunity of joining my mother in the 80s, and that's how I came to um, the United Kingdom to pursue uh, my, my A-levels in Leeds, uh, uh, I have to say, and then went to pursue my degree um, at Leeds Polytechnic then. Uh, it, it, it's interesting because I know, I know you may want to continue with this line of thought, but I have to say when I came in, I did my A-levels. I've always had at the back of my mind that education was for me just because of the uh, background I, I grew up in, and education was same for my, my, my siblings. So I had always wanted to be a medical doctor because as I said, your parents determined what you, what you have to be. So they singled me out, Charles, you have to be a medical doctor. My other brother has to be a lawyer and um, somebody has to be an accountant. So, but they supported us to no end. The sacrifice was unbelievable. So I did my A-levels and I was shot by uh, one A-level points. And I was really, really distraught because here you are, your plan of being a medical doctor uh, have just uh, gone away. And then it was difficult then to have a, a black student, a, a black uh, international student get into a medical school. So I was so distraught that I stayed at home and said, look, I have to wait for another year. But my mother never had it. He said, look, you've got good grades. You can do any other thing but medicine. You can do. And I just wouldn't have it. And I, I thought I'll stay back and do. She pushed me and I waited and waited till a week to the end of clearing, I would me. And I said, well, if I had to do anything to please her, I had to do it in Leeds where she lives, I would me. So I went to Leeds Polytechnic and there was only one course left. And that course was quantity surveying. And that was the only time I've heard of quantity surveying. And I quickly went to the careers uh, advisory counselor at uh, Marion House in Leeds and said, look, can they tell me what, uh, quantity surveying was, and they told me, and I went straight to Leeds Polytechnic to speak to the admissions tutor, and they said, well, you have wonderful grades. What are you doing here? Um, we only have one, one space left for quantity surveying. Do you want to do it? I had no choice then. Wanted to please my mother, and I didn't want to waste that year. So I said, look, if I stay there after one year, and I don't like it, and I um don't think it's for me i will leave it and lo and behold i was there first year i did very very well i was the first in class and i stayed i was first in class fortunately for the next three years and i came out with the first class honors so that's how i started uh, my, my my journey so i'll stop here because i know you may have some very very uh, definite questions you may want to ask yeah that's, that's very interesting indeed um so you didn't actually stay in quantity surveying then did you well, I, I've always been, so I stayed in quantity surveying, uh, I did so well, and part of that uh, uh, degree was a four-year degree, uh, then it was a thick sandwich program. Uh, so in the very early, late 80s, I think it's 1989, I spent a year on site, and there was the beginning of a very, very big shock and experience. Uh, uh, the only black person on site, and I've always been the only black person in my class, up till my PhD days. So it was a very, very rude uh, awakening on site uh, with all uh, the name calling on all the racism. Then it was racism right into your face. It, it, it wasn't uh, what you call insidious or very, very, um, shall I say, uh, polite uh, way of uh, doing things. It was in your face. But I, I've always had uh, something about me that uh, also allowed me to uh, be able to navigate that. And I'm sure we're going to speak about that. So I did my first degree in quantity surveying, which is in the built environment, went and did construction management, which again is in the built environment, and then went and did PhD. 
uh, again in the built environment, which was construction and project management. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. I mean, we heard earlier from our students about their experience in the night in the 2020s, um, and your experience was in the 1980s. Do you think things have changed? I, I think I was listening very, very attentively to uh, our students and alumni, and much of what they said was at, at the heart of uh, my, my journey. And if, if I could uh, paraphrase some of the uh, phraseology uh, students and alum, alumni uh, used, they talked about being overlooked. They talked about being unsupported. They talked about uh, the stereotypes. They talked about uh, intense pressure. And one I thought they talked about always wanting to prove yourself so mm -hmm. as to be accepted. Uh, of course, all those were there, but in my own days, it was really, really in your face. They they, they spoke to you, uh, they used the N-word, they looked at mm -hmm. your face and asked you directly, what would you do about it? Um, so th things, in a way, you could argue, uh, have moved on slightly, not because the issue isn't there, but that very, very uh, um, in your face, overt, um, Perhaps it's still there, but not to the extent uh, to which it was. Um, but I, I could uh, see myself in the uh, lives of uh, our, our students these days. And as a vice chancellor, it, I, I was touched deeply that some of these things they are saying is happening in my university. And that's where it really, really uh, means we have to do a great deal more. Yes. Absolutely. Do you want to say a little bit about the sort of things that uh, you think we should be doing, just having heard uh, the students talk earlier? Uh, there's real, real work we need to do. Uh, and I think I'm really, really grateful and thankful to the staff working so hard to get the race uh, equality charter. And it, it is indeed something to be proud of, getting the bronze award. What that tells us, as you kindly pointed out uh, in your opening, is that it tells us that uh, we have identified some issues uh, and that's the start of any other thing. Uh, identify the issues, put in place some action plans. And I think that word action, I think it's important. Action that is meaningful, action that needs to be measured and action that the outcome needs to be communicated. So it has to be actionable. So uh, one of the things I think we need to do, and it comes out of uh, some of the thoughts of our students. I think as a university, we need to be very, very bold to say, not just being an institution where we need to say um, racism is not good. We need to be an anti-racist uh, institution, one that champions what we need to do. I think we need to bring in what I call an office of institutional equity, uh, an office whose sole aim is to bring in a, a fairer, inclusive environment. One that is not placed anywhere, not with the HR, not part of the uh, academic, not part of any professional services that will have a director or a dean of the Office of Institutional Equity that reports to me as the vice chancellor and sits in the executive meeting and be a lens to look at all our policies and practices to make sure equity is all there. I think it's important. I want things to be actionable so that issues of diversity, issues of equality and inclusivity, it's there. Anyone who, for whatever reason, is staff, a student, a member of the stakeholder community who has anything to do with us, feels that things haven't gone well for them for one, two, or three reasons. They will go through the right channel within their heads of divisions, head of department, but they can have confidence that there is a unit that will look into that objectively and thoroughly and come out and report to the wider university what they're saying. I think that confidence is important. And we need to measure how well we're doing in terms of uh, 
um, how our students are doing in all the key metrics, how we are doing in terms of transparency, how we're doing in terms of uh, how we reflect the community at large, both in terms of number, seniority and position. That's where I think I need to be. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's really, really telling uh, what uh, our students and our, our colleagues have done and I was listening to the chat and he, and seeing what uh, our colleagues are uh, uh, were saying as these students and their uh, alumni and it, it, it begs it, it comes back to what I believe strongly that there is power in lived experiences and that's how we need to get that I remember somebody asking me Charles all these black life matters isn't it just a uh, a political statement people are doing and I look back and say, if you are on the receiving side, if you have lived it as I have lived it here for 35 years, and if you have had the opportunity that I have had uh, of being a mentor to black and white uh, staff, and I've been mentor for over 100 people uh, over a period of 25 years, and having had the singular opportunity as I have as a president of the Chartered Institute of Building, championing welfare and well-being, and see how this have impacted lives, how people have lost their lives, how careers have come to an end, how potentials that have promised have been put to a stop. This is not a political statement. This is real. And uh, it has to be real for everyone. I, I know there was a question around, um, is it only Black Lives Matters? I think from a humanistic point of view, everybody's life matters. Everybody has potential. Everybody has promise. And we, especially the university, especially leaders like myself, must, and I use the word must, if we have that opportunity, must work very hard to make sure every life matters, especially the lives of our students and staff here in our university. Okay, that's really, really interesting. Just a question around um, the Office for um, Institutional Equity. We talk a lot in higher education about uh, student engagement and co-production and co-creation. How do you think our students will be able to shape this, this new office? What I, I want this office to really, really do, uh, apart from the very, very important highlights I put across, they will be organizing events just like this more regularly. They will be organizing education and training for our staff and for our students. They will be getting best practices wherever they are to um, bring to bear they will be working with the student body all student body all staff all staff networks they will be looking at our data and i think it's important uh, because uh, uh, one of the things i often hear it's charles what's your take on other students people keep talking about black life matters i i think inclusivity in this is important and let's not forget, there are some of our white students, our white male students from working class who are not getting the opportunity they need. And I think we need to get this data analytics to look at all our students, especially around the intersectionality. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about is the power of looking at what's happening in the intersectionality. And we talk about the black as if it's uh, um, uh, a student, as if it's just a very strong homogeneous body. And I was hearing from um, uh, a number of uh, uh, students, even within the black, you have the, the black Africans, you have the black Caribbeans, they, they see life through their lens slightly differently. If you look at our Asian students, you look at those from China, you look at those from Bangladesh, and you look at those from, uh, say, our Pakistani students. We need to look at the, the intersectionalities. Even in the white, 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 white student, I talked about um, uh, our white male students from working background. Everybody matters. And I want the Office of Institutional Equity through effective information and data analytics, to be informed by data, informed by leads experience, to look at the lives and the opportunities of 
every student and every staff. So inclusivity is absolutely at the heart of what we do. Nobody should be left behind. Absolutely. I like that. Nobody should be left behind. And it's so true, I think, Charles, what you talk about in terms of how we see black as a homogenous group and then we stop seeing the individuals within that. Um, just a few thoughts about uh, Black Lives Matter movement and injustices faced by black people. What, what, what's your take, your, your view about this movement and what's happening at the moment and what can it be a lever for? I think uh, it, it is uh, an important movement. And the point I made that uh, uh, from where I sit and from my lived experiences and from the opportunities uh, and from my journey, it is nothing to do with political statement. It is really, really real and it affects lives and lives of everyone. I think for me, it's provides an opportunity for us to look at a number of things happening in our society. Um, UK, elsewhere, but nonetheless, things that happen to humanity. So issues around racism, issues around injustice, issues around intolerance, discrimination, systematic disparity, structural inequalities, is they are still with us and we need to really really work collectively the black community cannot address this we all must work hard to address it the issue of working collectively the issue of using agencies and allies wherever they come from it's really really important there are there are about three or four lessons for me uh, coming out of uh, the Black Lives Matters and the death of George Floyd. Mm. One is to say, sadly, these issues are still with us. I think we need to recognize them. It also allows me to think very, very reflectively and deeply to say, what happens after a year, two years, when the news coverage is finished, when the world moves on, because George Floyd's death really, really important. There are those who went before him, are with me? And likely there are those who will go after him, are with mm -hmm. me? So the question is, what have we learned? What should we be learning that allows us to have a sustained, meaningful, long-term, sets of actions that will begin, begin to make a difference. So the question is, our attention span should be more than a year, two, three years. It also brings to life for me the fact that we can all do better and we must need to be doing better. But what it brings to me, which I think it's powerful, it's the issue of hope the issue of goodness in humanity. And we need to tap that goodness in humanity. Just imagine and see what happens after the death, how the world rallied around. Black, white, people of different faiths, people of no faiths. Really, really at the heart of faith, it's humanity, knowing that what has happened isn't right. So there is goodness in humanity. We need to tap into that goodness. And finally, for me, it's the importance of information and data. Because if you look at how that case panned out and why it became a successful outcome in case, mm -hmm. is the power of data, the power of information, the fact that there is something that we can all see that it's difficult to shake your belief because it's there, it's life. I think that speaks to me as a leader of a university that says we need to look at how all our students are performing, how we're supporting all our students, how our support is making a significant difference in the lives, whether it's the student retention, the student progression, uh, the student engagement, the outcome, whether we have real reflective number of staff in our society, whether our staff are promoted when they need to be promoted, 
we have data, we have data analytic. That should also inform us. So there must be power in data analytic to begin to be able to put real actions, be informed through data so that our decision making is really, really objective and evidence based. So I think that data is important. These are some of the lessons I've learned from uh, what has happened in the last uh, year at least. Absolutely. I think um, what I've learned from, from our students and from working at Leeds Trinity is there's that combination of data, history, and learning from that history, and having an, a certain type of emotional intelligence that put together can really help us move forward. Which really brings me to my, my next question to you is the George Floyd um, murder is not in isolation. Um, there's something around the murder and the Black Lives mo Movement that is really iconic in terms of a time in history that we're actually part of. And it's, it's you know, very important to, I think, all our staff at the university and all our students. But how do we, as an institution of learning, um, pull that into our curriculum, perhaps even pull that into the, uh, the, the drive behind the Centre for Equity? I think that that's really, really important. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say um, all of us, and I say that very advisedly, all of us are on a journey here. Are with me? All of us are learning, and we're all scholars in that uh, uh, that journey. It's also uh, fair to say that as we do this learning, we need to be really, really open honest, transparent. And that's why I thought what we've heard from our students and the alumni was very, very powerful and real. And we must begin to learn from that. I think we also need to think carefully about a number of things, processes, systems, but more powerfully, the culture. I think we need to build a very, very powerful, inclusive culture. I know people 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 talk about culture as, as if it's just one thing. We need to make it work for us. We need to listen to all voices. We need to make sure people have a, a sense of belonging. We need to make sure that everyone feel valued and that there is a sense of uniqueness in each one of us. And collectively in that diversity, there needs to be pride, there needs to be power, there needs to be positivity. And it's through that diversity, you draw from all the skill sets, all the knowledge, all the assets, all the wisdom. And as you've seen this morning, you draw from all the lived experiences and channel that to the common good of everyone. Access to resources, mm -hmm. making sure uh, people who need to uh, genuinely have what they have, need to have, have it, and people's opportunities are realized. And there is fairness, there is equity in everything we do. And I, I believe that that Office of Institutional Equity should help us. They can't do it alone, which is why I think we must collectively put our hands together to make sure that this, this works. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint, but I think we have everything it takes to begin to do that. Openness, candor, wanting to make a difference and giving everybody a chance, an opportunity, making sure that every voice is heard. And I think it's that, that's important. And leadership has a role to play and accountability of the leaders, of myself, and those who take leadership role in a university like us, really, really important. We must show that it's working. We must have measures to show it's working. We need to get allies and agents. We need to be open, clear, and support one another because everybody is learning on this. I mean, you use the word accountability and it's a theme of the, the, the event today and people have used it throughout. How do you, 
how can we make sure it's we have, we will have real accountability and it's not merely a rhetorical term? Very, very good question. And there are many ways of doing that. First of all, uh, we are developing a new strategy um, where people, equality, diversity and inclusivity is at the heart of that. We are, as I've said, developing something unique. Mm -hmm. I believe it's unique. The Office of Institutional Equity that stands on its own. There are only two universities in the whole of United Kingdom that has this. University of East London and Open University. So we will do that. We will make sure that all our policies, which is one of the uh, activities and roles of this center, that all our policies have in them that notion of inclusivity, fairness, parity, and the notion of uh, diversity. We will also make sure we develop real constructs real measuring criteria, whether it is how we are improving. And uh, I was really, really glad to see how we are improving in terms of uh, the student uh, um, progression and how, if you like, our attainment gap, the difference in gap between our white students and our, our black and ethnic minority students who come out with first and two one it's narrowed to 2.4 uh it's a lot better than the uh he average of about 10 about 13 percent we are 2.4 we need to close that gap we also need to measure ourselves in terms of how many of our female staff are in the high positions how many of our black and ethnic minority our professors are in the high situations? Mm. We need to also prove uh, in terms of uh, uh, the white male students from um, disadvantaged backgrounds are also progressing well like their white counterparts. Mm. And similarly, our white academic staff, how are they doing? Mm. Our staff, uh, who uh, have disability, how are they doing? We look at the protected character, uh, uh, characteristics. How well are they doing? I'm very, very keen that we measure ourselves, are with me, and we begin to see how well we're doing. If we don't do that, it will just become platitudes. It will just become, yes, we've got this uh, race equality charter. I think the, the real question is, so what? What have we got to show that? I'm really, really passionate. I'm really, really determined. I believe strongly that a successful university has to draw from the diversity it has. Mm -hmm. And we are very, very ambitious as a university, but realistic. And we know we can achieve for every member of the student body and the staff body. But I have to preface that to say it is a journey. It is a marathon, it's not a sprint, but I think people by virtue of accountability need to see improvement and how the things are changing over a period of time and we should be doing that. Absolutely, yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Charles. I think one of the things that keeps coming up and there's a lot of research around this is that to, um, to be able to create a big new development like this. It's really important to have everybody on side pulling together. And some of the uh, the, the, the chat comments are, are really talking about uh, us being a united team to be able to do this. Um, how I mean, sense of belonging for our students is, is so important. And I'm thinking we need to make sure that they feel they belong to Leeds Trinity, they belong to Leeds, but they're also developing, developing into global citizens. So I just wondered what your thoughts were around uh, links with the broader region, uh, international, and um, um, just just around that particular growth. So we're not thinking about ourselves as Leeds Trinity in Horsforth, but Leeds Trinity globally. Okay, that, that's a very, very useful question. Really, really important. And uh, I'm not sure I've got all the time to answer this, but let, let, let me just put something across. Uh, of my many years of mentoring um, BAME staff and students. And I do hear, as you would expect me uh, to hear, 
that we don't have mentors. We don't have enough black staff to look to to to, to begin to uh, see ourselves there. I don't think this staff really understand us. Um, I, 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 I don't think they understand the lives of the, the BAME community. I don't think I'm supported. How would I be supported if they don't understand? I think we need to open up. We need to provide an opportunity for mentoring, both for staff, uh, for students, uh, peers, student peers, if need be. I think we need to internationalize our curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to think about an inclusive cu curriculum. And I know at times people frown from the word, the phrase decolonized curriculum. And uh, it's, it's an area where I have read and researched over the years. Um, decolonized curriculum doesn't mean we're taking away from the curriculum. I think too often people think if you decolonize, you're taking away. I think mm -hmm. what decolonized means, it's you adding to, you making people understand the history and to contextualize the history and make it relevant to people and think about the relevance of the day. That's what it is. But to answer your question, we need to draw from internationalization. We need to draw from people outside our immediacy. And I think it's important whether it is getting people to come, whether it is bringing it into our curriculum through case studies that reflects the, the truism and the number and the extent of our student base or our staff base. I think it's really, really uh, uh, important. And part of our strategy moving forward is that we want to get into internationalization. We want to develop global citizens and to, to, to develop global citizens, part and parcel of that will be to make sure they see that within their curriculum, to give them the opportunity either through placement or employability, um, looking beyond um, lead street, city region and uh, elsewhere. Because the world we live is changing very, very fast. The expectation is changing. I, I, I remember when I was a, a young student, we were only thinking about getting our first job and once you're in your first job, you know what, all is done. But uh, over the years, individual students that finish are looking at no less than eight to 15 different jobs before they retire. And so things are different and the world is getting smaller uh, as, as we uh, continuously move and develop ourselves. So that's how I think we need to do that. Uh, give people opportunities, learning from a uh, wider uh, knowledge base. No individual institution is, if you like, a custodian of all knowledge. We just need to learn from afar to help our students and staff. That, that's really great, Charles. Um, just before I ask you my last couple of questions, I just want to remind people to put their questions in the chat because there'll be plenty of time for those questions. And I think Lucy is going to um, sort of um, direct me to them in, in a few minutes. But just back, back to you, Charles. Um, you, know, you said you've been you know, challenging racial inequality for at least 30 odd years, probably all your, your life in many different forms. What is it that... Um, has enabled you to stay so motivated and to just keep doing it? And what pointers would you give others? It is interesting because uh, that particular question has kept coming on and on as I mentor uh, both black and white uh, uh, academic staff and students. There, there, there are, as I say, there are 12 things which uh, keep me going. <laughs> One is um, there is no substitute for hard work and determination. Perseverance is really, really important. Patience, resilience, in my view. What I call inner self-belief in oneself, um, call it confidence, but it's no arrogance. Part of that also is humility. You need to be humble. Positivity. I'm always somebody that says the glass is half full and not empty. Dedication to whatever you do. 
Give it everything you have. Give it not just 150%. Give it 500% if you can. Strive to achieve excellence in my view. And also think about trusting in people. And I know that sounds really, really tough. Wherever I, I, I tell my uh, mentee, trust in people. No one is an island unto himself or herself. No one can succeed without succeeding through people. Yes, many will let you down, but for you to move on, you will need people. So you have to trust and believe and keep faith in that trust. Always put yourself forward, even when they knock you down. Always try to give, put yourself forward uh, and uh, manage the consequences. And finally, and I say this from lived experiences, and I think it, at times people say, Charles, it's easier you saying this than acting it out. Never bottle up an anger or hatred and never let it spill over to somebody else, especially those who have nothing to do. Always think about other people in what you do. I think it's important. And finally to say, I am a, a prayerful person. Uh, and that there are three things I do ask whenever I pray. I ask for wisdom. I ask for tolerance. And I ask to be used to make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate and I like those last three things. Wisdom and tolerance in particular. Fantastic. So. Charles, just a few questions just around the race equality charter because that has been a driver, part driver for where we are at the moment. Um, do you think it will have meaningful change in higher education? I mean, there is there are views that this might just be a tick box, but do you think it's meaningful? Has it brought any changes and how can we make sure that it's going to make a difference for us? I honestly believe that talking about something, exchanging views, being honest and being open, doing that in a meaningful way and being real, I think it's important because as you do that, you are showing that there is an issue, there's a problem. And the start of anything is to identify the problem. I think if I look at the last 35 years from a lived experience point of view, from the lens in which I say things, yes, it hasn't improved the way I would like, but there is some level of acknowledgement now, greater now than it had ever been. This is not to say that there is no injustices and racism. Um, I believe it's still there, but people are beginning to understand that the impact it's having is really, really devastating if we don't manage it well. Um, I, I do tell people that uh, over the last 35 years, I, 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 I recall when I was a young researcher going to look at those organizations that have won innovation award because my background is in construction and I went to a chief executive officer of a company and I was asking his views on why they want to innovate and how people play a role and what kind of people and whether diversity plays a role. He looked at me, a black researcher and said, we don't have any black member of staff here. Um, we, we, we innovate and we can innovate without having a black staff here. And here you have standing in front of him, a black researcher. And he said that without even blinking an eyelid. But over the years I've learned to, I found myself in a number of, of this kind of things and how to, to manage it. This is a chief, executive officer saying that openly right in front of me um, perhaps now you may not get that kind of stuff I would mean it may be very very subtle um, so things have improved perhaps 
and, and things about racial improvement is not, shall I say, linear. Are, are you with me? Whilst those kinds of things seemingly, and I use the word seemingly, have improved, the other aspects perhaps may not, perhaps arguably has moved from that which is overt to that which perhaps is very, very subtle. Um, and, and that's the challenge, but people are beginning to talk about it. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we will begin to work on this together. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I could ask you many, many more questions, but I'll have the opportunity somewhere else. I've just seen we've got at least 10 questions waiting in the chat room. So I'm going to take a few of those for the next, um, I think we've got another 10 or 15 minutes. So Charles, you ready for the first one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as ready as one can be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, someone's saying um, fantastic uh, journey. Congratulations. Evidence suggests that school and university teachers are literate around gender, sexuality, disability, class, but extremely illiterate around race and racism. Do you feel this is an area to de develop at Trinity in improving the lived experience of your students and staff? That's a very, very uh, interesting question. Very, very thought, thought through question. I, I think Let's let's be just honest. Um, the discussion around race, for many, it's not an easy one. I would me. Um, and anything about uh, um, race, whether it's racialism or racism, anything uh, around that, it's it, it's challenging and difficult and never easy. And uh, many many people just because of that. Um, prefer to take a quieter position, not because deep down they don't see any, they don't see that it's wrong, but uh, too often uh, there's somebody who says uh, the human life. Everybody wants things simple. I would mean, why make things complicated? I would mean, um, yes, Leeds Trinity has a role to play, uh, and I think we need uh, having got to the position of get, getting the race equality charter, having acknowledged that uh, we have some work to do, let's do that work. Let's try and be a beacon. Let's support one another internally first and see how we support others. I talked about the issue of education and training, and I want uh, this uh, Office for Institutional Equity to, to, to try and support that. And whilst we have this uh, institution, uh, institute, it's not as if they are going to solve all the problems. Everybody has a role to play. And I think we need to begin to educate people. And you'd educate people in, in many ways. Um, what we are doing today is part of education, and I'm learning a great deal by hearing the voices, listening to the lived experiences. And things like this really, really motivate me to go and do much. And I I'm very, very fortunate to be in the position of a vice chancellor, a leader of a university, having that opportunity to begin to make a difference. We will make that difference to the lives of our students and our staff and to the community. And I think it's very, very important. I've also uh, had the opportunity of uh, being part of the Leeds Learning Alliance. And I know uh, our, our, our chair uh, is part and parcel of this uh, our, our meeting, uh, Paul Brennan. And we have set up um, a working group that looks into uh, leadership and, and race. And we also need to support other universities, other institutes, other colleges, other organizations in private and public. And I'm sure that's one of the things that Leeds Learning Alliance will want to do. So we need allies. We need people who will help champion this. But we are all in a journey. Uh, we will make our mistakes. Everyone needs to make a mistake. Everyone has to fail, but let's fail forward and learn and support one another in doing that. OK, thank you. Somebody's asking what the reporting mechanisms would be for students uh, in terms of racism uh, within the equity centre. Now, would would it sit there or would it sit somewhere else? We, we, we have a um, 
currently we have a situation where um, students who are grieved, who have issues, to report that, and that will continue. Um, those issues where it's not satisfactory, and we think we need to dig closer to that, I will see the Office of Institution uh, Equity come into that to make sure that it's been thoroughly looked at, that there's objectivity in how it's done. And this is for staff as well, who might think that the mm -hmm. systems in place uh, mm -hmm. perhaps haven't addressed their issues, but in terms of promotion, them mm -hmm. relieving their career. But we already have a system in place. We need to see whether it needs to work better. But you have something that one will eventually fall at if they think it's not uh, giving them the answer they, they, they want. And I think it's important. Okay. Yeah, I know from talking to you previously and, and hearing you speak, you're very clear about having that, making that call for action, but also making sure that people know the processes and have an understanding so that they have the confidence then to use yes. the processes that are set up. So I'm really pleased about that. I, 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 and next, just, to, I, just to say, sorry to interject, uh, Nadira, course. just to say we need to get into a place mm. where what we have at the moment mm. gives every one of us the highest level of confidence. I would me, and yeah. I think that's that, that's where that's what a truly inclusive uh, culture and environment should be. That even taking that to a place like the Office of um, Institutional Equity yeah. is the place of last resort. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think. Um, our session with the students has really shown us the way in terms of having those discussions, uh, but having them with our staff as well, and then having that dialogue between staff and students as well, so that we build that trust that you're talking about and that sense of belonging and honesty. Which then takes me to the next question around decolonization. Um, how are you ensuring that teacher training and teaching assistant courses are decolonized and that students have a true understanding before ed entering educational settings? I think that's that's really, really uh, important. Um, and it's not easy. Um, there are a number of ways university, some universities have done this. Um, one very, very important way, which uh, I also introduced um, when I was in my previous university, it's for every program, any new program, any new module, before that module has been approved, it needs to show, amongst every other thing it has to show, that it has taken on board the issue of inclusive curriculum, the in issue of decolonization. I would make just before it's approved, that it has really, really considered mm -hmm. that, that the team has considered that. That's for any new module and any program. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of doing that. The other way of doing that is also, to, to support our staff mm. as and I, I know there are universities who have developed what they call the community of practice around this issue of inclusive curriculum and decolonize, uh, decolonized curriculum where they, they, they support one another to begin to improve the curriculum either by looking at the reading list, looking at the kind of case studies, uh, looking at uh, some of the feedback the students are uh, are saying, and I and I heard one of our uh, members of the panel saying that uh, uh, when he was a student here, there were certain things that were said, altered, and put in front of the student that perhaps didn't sit well with some of the black students. I would me, we should have communities of practice to, mm -hmm. to do that. And as we move on as a university, we are going to set up what we call a center for excellence in learning and teaching. I would mean mm -hmm. that we look in at the quality of our academic staff to support them in training. Yes, it will be looking at TEL, technology enhanced learning. I would also want them to be looking at our curriculum, making sure it's really, really fit for purpose, that it really, really captures the essence of true inclusivity and reflects mm -hmm. the embodiment of our student base. So there are certain things uh, we can do. And I know there are good practices elsewhere. So the point I was making is there are things we don't need to reinvent the wheel. See what happens elsewhere, not because we just want to 
throw it into the university, see whether there are things we need to learn and how we need to get from best practice to make sure it works for us as a university, Leeds Trinity University. Okay, brilliant. A question around uh, equality impact assessments for policies and procedures. Uh, someone feels there's been very little progress in the university or all universities in this area. How will we start to address this at Leeds Trinity? It, it, it is important because uh, I know um, when I was uh, a dean of school at mm -hmm. uh, London South Bank that almost every report you produce, mm -hmm. you have a cover page. And the two things there, it has it responded to e uh, equality, diversity, inclusivity, and has it addressed that particular point? I would mean just to make sure it's in your phrase, face, and you reflect on it. I think I think that's there's good practice in that. And as a university, we need to think whether it's something uh, we need to uh, uh, put in place. But I, I but I, I think what really really works, it's when there is real meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. um, where we're just not doing this and ticking the box, that yeah. the culture is there, that it comes like second nature, that when we do things, we think about it. Uh, maybe, maybe as we start, we need to put these checks and balances, but in the fullness of time, it's about how the culture is embedded, mm -hmm. how we really, really want to make a change. And I mean, we, collective all of us but you can put some processes and systems to allow that to build in and that's just one way one can do that mm. i mean you've mentioned cultural change quite a lot through your your talk um and i know that um, during lockdown it, it's it's not as easy to sense what the culture is or to bring about that change what, what what do you think are the key areas of cultural change that you'd like to see at least trinity i think uh I think a, a number of uh, researchers in this area have defined culture as the way we do things here, our belief, our norms, how we feel, our collective energies to doing things. So we need to ask ourselves the fundamental question. Do we as a university truly believe that there are benefits around equity? that there are benefits around diversity, that we need everyone to have a sense of belonging, that we need to support one another in that pursuit of true inclusivity. And whether you are doing that face to face, whether you are doing that online, whether you're doing that through blended learning or MS team or Zoom, that drive, it's what is there, are with me? you begin to know what good looks like because collectively, that's where you want to position yourself. The medium by which you do that, in a way, it's, it's immaterial, I would mean, but the honesty, the fact that we all believe that, it's what should drive us. And that's why you hear me talk about culture. Even when we have the processes and systems and we look at things and people take to say you've done that, Mm. It's when you look inwardly, I would me, mm. uh, you need to know. I'll just tell you a short story. Mm -hmm. I, I did have a very, very um, bright, young, white uh, um, associate professor whom I mentored um, for, for three years, who came to me and said, Charles, I am really, really depressed because some of my students came to me and complained to my line manager that uh, I was racist to them. And I know this gentleman for a very, very long time. He was really, really distraught. And he said, Charles, how can I? And I said, what did they say to you? What did you do? Say, Charles, for the life of me, I cannot think. And I was just trying to implore and ask questions because he has confidence in me and I have the highest level of confidence in him. And he was and he was saying he did this, he did this, he did this. And I said, you know what? These things you have told me, many black students will construe that as racism. You may not know that. I would me. But sitting where I sit, um, I think you have done what you've done unknowingly. I would me. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you look deep, 
you notice that some of the words, some of the how, how you've plotted some of these black students and you haven't done that to their white counterparts. The way they feel is that you've stereotyped them that they cannot, are you with me? Mm -hmm. And he never in the wildest dreams wanted to do that, but he has done that uh, unconsciously and perhaps part of what unconscious bias is all about and has done that. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with him and I said, look, I understand. And I went with him and I said, look, I'll go with you to the class and I would say exactly what has transpired. And I said I went to the class with him and I told all the students in a very, very tactfully diplomatic way. And uh, it went down so well that half of the class came to, came to me to say, Charles, we, 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 perhaps we now know what has happened. He didn't do that deliberately, but there are lessons for everybody. And that's what culture is, are with me? There are times we don't know what we're doing, which is why I said we are in a journey together. And education, learning, knowing what microaggression is, um, being able to know what we could do that harms or displeases others, it's important. I just wanted to tell you that story to see how things can, can shape up. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, I mean, I think it's all in the examples and the stories, people's narratives and experience are so, so very powerful. We're coming to a close now, and I am going to take the final question from the chat rooms. So apologies to people if I've missed yours, but this is a very interesting one. In your day-to-day -day work as vice chancellor and outside forums such as today, how do you feel about being known as Britain's black vice chancellor? Is that a burden or a sense of pride for you? It's it's a, a huge privilege and an and, and, and honor. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate in my life um, to have uh, held uh, uh, positions where I believe opportunity avails themselves to make a difference. I've got to where I've got to through people. Um, of course, one works hard, but you've got to where you go through. And that's why at times when I talk about my journey, I talk about the role that people play, the, the, the essence of trusting people. You cannot get to where you want to get without working through people. No one is an island. So I, I, I don't think it's a burden. I think it's an opportunity. Of course, there is expectation. Of course, there is um, it, 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 responsibility, shall I say, and accountability. One expects you to do what a leader has to do, whether it's Charles, whether it's somebody here, uh, a white colleague, um, it's a very privileged opportunity to make a difference. And I'd like to work with my colleagues to see how we make a difference to the lives of our students, to the life of our staff, and also if opportunity avails itself to make a difference in the wider community which we serve. So it's a privilege and a huge honor for me. Great, fantastic. And it's a privilege and an honour for us to have you here as our Vice Chancellor. And thank you so much indeed, Charles, for giving us insights into your personal life, your ambitions for yourself and your ambitions for, for the university. But is there anything you would have liked to have been asked today that you haven't been asked? Not, not particularly. Uh, I, I, I thought you've uh, you've asked a very, very thorough questions and the, the, the opening by our students, very, very rich and telling. One cannot tell one's lives in one hour or two hours. Um, but uh, hopefully um, colleagues and students and friends have heard what I have to say. Uh, I just want to end up by saying we need to be hopeful. Um, there is hope. Uh, and I think genuinely we can all make a difference in our lives, in the life of our institution and in the lives of the organization. I think some of these movements are just bringing things to the fore and telling us that no one person can do it all, that for us to be effective, we need to mean it. We need to be true with one oneself and we will need to be true with others. And it's through a collective effort that we can achieve. So there is hope and I'm ever, ever hopeful and determined to do the little I can in this regard. That's fantastic, Charles, and that's already rubbing up on, on us. Uh, 
um, as members of staff here. Um, so much in the chat room about how inspiring your, your contributions have been today, how much people want to have more dialogue with you. And I can assure people that uh, this is just the beginning. We have an annual uh, race equality conference, which we'll hear more about. And uh, there'll be a number of seminars and we'll have lots and lots of dialogue opportunities in the future. But in the meantime, Charles, thank you so much for giving us your time and just letting us have you all to ourselves this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadira, for posing the questions. Thank, thank you so much. Now I think I'm handing over to, to Madeline for the next session. You're on mute, Madeline. Um, the next session is lunch. So, um, yeah, <laughs> lunch yes. until 12.45. OK, and um, we'll come back at 12.45 and then you're introducing the next session. I am, yes. Brilliant. yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all Thanks, for everyone. this morning. <laughs>